following is an exclusive presentation of the Yes Network. Why are we being taped? For what reason? The big Mercer thing? Yankeeography. <laughs> Bobby was the golden boy of the Yankees. And they're talking about, you know, you're the next Mickey Man on Bobby's thing. Let me be Bobby Mercer. He was a guy that you didn't want to have up there against you. But he came on the line. When you played against him, you respected him because you knew he was going to be there from the first pitch to the last out. He's got the quietness of Gehrig, the friendliness of Ruth, the dignity of DiMaggio, the congeniality of Mantle, all combined into one. Bobby Mercer's a Yankee. He's a great Yankee. When Bobby Mercer began his first full season with the Yankees in 1969, the sports writers had a field day calling him the next Mickey Mantle. After all, both he and Mantle were from Oklahoma. They both started as shortstops. Heck, Mercer even inherited Mantle's locker. Hi, I'm John Sterling for the Yes Network, and this is Yankeeography. No question, Bobby Mercer had some pretty big shoes to fill as Mantle's heir apparent. But there was one major difference between the two. Whereas Mantle played in the World Series his rookie year, it took Mercer a full 11 years in pinstripes before he got his first and only shot to play in the Fall Classic. Welcome to the World Series for 1981. Being in a World Series at Yankee Stadium, that was a dream come true. They have a special feeling for this kid. He had deserved that great feeling when you're introduced in game one and the whole team lines up along the baselines and what a great ovation he got that day. Number two, Bobby Mercer. After 15 big league seasons, Bobby Mercer finally found himself on the game's grandest stage. He had been the Yankee during the lean years, during the, uh, the Yankee Depression, as we have come to call it. Bobby starting his career with the Yankees and going to the Giants and the Cubs before returning to New York. I really took it as being an uh, extreme honor to be in the postseason, but more of an honor to be in there as a New York Yankee. It was the culmination of a dream that began in Oklahoma at a very early age. I cannot even remember how young I was when I started playing, but it had to be pretty young, and I've been playing ever since. <laughs> Bobby played three sports at Southeast High in Oklahoma City, but he didn't play the field. We knew each other as friends and started dating, and nobody thought that we would ever actually get married. When you were cheerleading, where did you cheer for the uh, baseball games? Over at the football Stadium. See, so you mean you didn't cheer? Not yeah. for baseball, <laughs> just for football. Sure. But while Kay was watching Bobby on the football field, there were other sets of eyes on him during baseball season, and they too saw something special. But they couldn't sign me until after I graduated from high school. That was the only stipulation. So they wanted to do it immediately. And so when I got my diploma in my hand, uh, the graduation ceremonies were over, I left the high school and I came back here and... There were a group of scouts that were just lined up out in the yard. You know, they like to move fast once, once, they, uh, once they are legally uh, able to do that. One by one, they would come in and they would sit down with he and his family and talk to him about what they had to offer. Each team had a different offer, but only one team was Bobby's favorite team. And that made all the difference. The Yankees offered me $10,000 less than the Dodgers did. I thought, well, I'll just make it up in World Series money. No big deal, you know. Just one year before he got there, the Yankees reached the World Series for the last time in a long time, losing to the Cardinals in 64. In 1965, the Yankees have a bunch of aging veterans. Really, the only prospect the Yankees had offensively would have been Bobby Mercer. Compounding the pressure of joining a veteran team, were those inevitable comparisons to Mantle. 
they looked at Bobby as another Mickey Mantle because Bobby was from Oklahoma. And so there were a lot of similarities in their backgrounds. Bobby also happened to be signed by the same scout that signed Mickey Mantle. They all figured he's Mantle's replacement. Well, you don't replace people like Mantle. In fact, Bobby was being groomed as Tony Kubek's replacement at shortstop when he got the call in September of 65. He was just 19 and about to endure some big league hazing. They were pretty tough on rookies. Uh, I guess it was more of a test than anything else, or maybe just initiation. Johnny Blanchard was uh, extremely tough on me. So I'd get on Bobby pretty good. See, the older guys would have a tendency to, to ride the, the, the rookies once in a while, you know. I had a sore arm in spring training, but I wouldn't dare go in the trainer's room because he would be all over you. And then it stopped, thanks to a newfound friend. When it looked like I was going to make the ball club, a guy by the name of Mickey Mantle put his arm around me in the clubhouse, and I guess everybody saw that, and from that moment on, nobody messed with me. Blanchard became a friend of mine, and I was accepted as a, as a New York Yankee and as a player. The most important veteran on the team, as far as Bobby Mercer was concerned, was Mickey Mantle. And Mickey Mantle treated him like a, I guess, like a son or a brother. With Mantle in his corner, Bobby relaxed. But on the field, he struggled. Like all young ball players, when they first get up there, they think they're going to be unbelievable, which sometimes that don't happen. Of course, when you're young and you're a rookie, all you're looking to do is go up there and swing that bat. So I was very aggressive, and if it was close where I could swing at it, I was probably hacking at it. <laughs> Mercer played just 32 games for the Yankees in 65 and 66, and prior to the 67 season, he was inducted into the Army. Spending two years, you know, during the Vietnam era and two years in the Army, took me two years away from baseball. When Bobby returned, he hit the ground running, both stronger and more disciplined. He'd seen enough of that Army by that time, and, and I think that uh, he put it all together. He was just older and more mature. Well, physically, he was, he was stronger. I think he'd put on uh, uh, maybe 10 or 15 pounds during that time in the service. I think all in all, uh, it, it helped me, not only as a player, but also as a man. Because when I came back, I was much more ready to handle the rigors and the pressures of playing uh, professional baseball maturity-wise. The Yankees had always had these the great players. I mean, going back to Roof, you know, Roof, Gary, DiMaggio, Mantle, and now Mercer's going to be the next Mantle, and he wasn't the next Mantle. Bobby Mercer had no illusions, you know, that he was going to be Mickey Mantle. Following the retirement of the legendary Mickey Mantle, the Yankees turned their attention to the man who had seemingly been destined to replace him. The Yankees had always had these the great players. I mean, going back to Roof, you know, Roof. Gary, DiMaggio, Mantle, and now Mercer's gonna be the next Mantle, when he wasn't the next Mantle. He didn't run as fast as Mantle. He didn't hit the ball as far as Mantle. He wasn't gonna hit what the average at Mantle was, but he was gonna be a good Major League ball player. Poor Bobby comes up there and they're talking about, well, you know, you're the next Mickey Mantle. Bobby's thinking, hey, just let me be Bobby Mercer. Bobby Mercer had no illusions, you know, that he was gonna be Mickey Mantle. When people would ask him how it was to be compared with Mickey Mantle, Bobby said, that never bothered me because I was honored and flattered to be compared with Mickey Mantle, whereas Mickey, I often wondered what Mickey thought about me being compared to him. Beyond the fact that they were both from Oklahoma, Mercer and Mantle also began their pro careers as teenagers and as infield prospects. But it wasn't long before Bobby, like Mickey, was moved to the outfield. Defensively, Bobby always wore the glove out on the end of his hand because he didn't want to get his hand hurt. I knew he was sensitive. I knew Bobby wasn't going to be a, a shortstop. One defining moment was in Seattle. Ralph Houck was the manager. I was playing third base. One guy hit me up nice two hopper at third base, and as I picked it up, some guy yelled out of the stands, watch out, he's got it again. <laughs> and I think Ralph heard that, so I came in. He said, young man, when we come to the ballpark tomorrow, you take some fly balls in the outfield. Of course, people getting behind first base are getting killed, so we moved him to center field. And though the cavernous dimensions of Yankee Stadium were daunting, Mercer proved to be a quick study. He was an outstanding center fielder. He could see the ball good off the bat, 
and then with his speed, he could go right to the ball. He had a gun for an arm, so it's not surprising to me that he was able to play center field the way he did. Mercer flourished in center field, but he also took a liking to right field, that is, when he was at the plate. When you're looking for somebody to fit Yankee Stadium, you would like for them to be somewhat of a natural pull hitter. You see it's 296 down the right field line, 344 in the alley, and 463 out here, and 427 out here. It doesn't take a genius to, <laughs> to realize that you don't want to be going that way, that you'd like to be going down the right field line. The house that Ruth built was built for a left-handed hitter, and uh, Bobby had that swing that he could reach that short fence in right field in Yankee Stadium. He was telling me for that ballpark. I mean, he hung over the plate and just hit thing inside. You know, look out, home run. I don't think the Yankees really thought that I would become a what you would qualify as a power hitter, but I did. In fact, Bobby hit 26 home runs his first full season, more than Berra, Garrig, or Mantle their first time around. This made Mercer a fan favorite in the midst of some troubled times for the team. The depression years of the late 60s, Bobby Mercer was the most significant player on those teams. Mercer was a good player. Well, I'll make that a very good player on a very bad team. Bobby Mercer was the one shining light, and if you were rooting for the Yankees, you were rooting for Bobby Mercer. And the fans never rooted louder than one night when Cleveland came to town in 1970. For that's when Bobby put on quite a show. It was a doubleheader, so I hit uh, my last in bat in the first game of the doubleheader. Mercer was the highlight of the game. He homered in his last at bat in the first game. In the second game, he came up the first time against Mike Paul hit a home run, and he came up against Mike Paul again. He hit another home run. Now he's got three consecutive home runs. And sure enough, he came up in the bottom of the eighth inning, and he hit his fourth consecutive home run over the course of a doubleheader. Mercer became the first Yankees player since Luke Gehrig to hit four straight home runs in one day. When you get into those streaks like that, you have the confidence to know that you're going to hit the ball hard. In 1971, with the burden of filling Mantle's shoes now behind him, Bobby's batting average rose 80 points to 331, second best in the American League. After about two and a half years, you kind of, you know, the bell goes off and you say, why am I fighting myself? Just relax and do what I'm capable of doing. And I think that's what happened to Bobby, and he settled in and became an outstanding ball player. I think it's just the maturity level beginning to set in. You know, it just takes a little bit of time, and as your career uh, progresses, you get better. 1970, 71, 72, he just had some great years. I mean, he's one of the feared guys in the American League. In 1972, Mercer had career highs in home runs, runs, and RBIs. He also captured his first gold glove. In turn, Bobby sought a raise, but first saw fit to consult the Mick. I don't know why I asked him, but I guess I felt like that since he was the $100,000 player, uh, I should pass it by him just to ask him what he thought about it. And he said, nah, you'll never get it. He said, that was the most I ever made, but I got it. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but I got it. At that time, I was the youngest $100,000 player ever in the history of the game. It was money well spent as Bobby once again hit over 300 in 1973. Mercer wasn't Mickey Mantle, but he was darn good. He was a very productive player, and had he been surrounded by better parts, he would have been honored and celebrated as a terrific player, which he was. Nineteen seventy four would be Mercer's eighth season with the Yankees, but he soon found out he wouldn't play it at the place he'd come to call home. They're going to refurbish, remodel Yankee Stadium, and they're going to spend two years at Chase Stadium, and that's going to be your home park. It would take two years to renovate the stadium, and so the Yankees were off to Queens. No one realized at the time the consequences that the not-so-friendly confines of Shea would have on Bobby's career. Playing in your own home park, you feel much more comfortable. I mean, who would want to move out of Yankee Stadium after you've developed all this Yankee Stadium stroke? He had the classic left-handed stroke for Yankee Stadium, which unfortunately, when the Yankees moved to Shea Stadium, he lost his power. 
He hit a couple of balls early in the year that would have been home runs in Yankee Stadium that were caught by the warning track in Shea Stadium. Fact is, Mercer had averaged 26 home runs in his last five seasons in the Bronx, but just 10 in 74 and only two at Shea. Still, Bobby found a silver lining in his power shortage. I know that I didn't hit a whole lot of home runs at Shea Stadium, but I still drove in the runs. I mean, my RBI total was still high. Uh, my average was still somewhat pretty good, but the home run total was down. With this in mind, the Yankees became concerned that Mercer would never again put up numbers like he did in the past. And so on October 22nd, 1974, the man who had played his entire career in a Yankees uniform received a most unpleasant wake-up call. It was about 8 a.m. in the morning, and I get this call, and, and I'm still asleep in Oklahoma, and, and it's uh, Gabe Paul on the phone. I think he said, I just want to uh, say that we've enjoyed uh, you playing here with the Yankees and that we've traded you to San Francisco. The Yankees did not make tons of trades, especially with superstars. And when they traded Bobby for another superstar, Bobby Bonds, I mean, it was, it was a major, major shock. When Bobby Mercer was traded to the San Francisco Giants, he was devastated. Bobby Mercer felt that he was going to always be a Yankee. It wasn't a good time in my life, leaving the pinstripes in Yankee Stadium in New York, which I didn't think I would ever leave, uh, was pretty devastating to me and, and my family because we loved it there. It was heartbreaking. And San Francisco just seemed like an entire world away from us. So Bobby and Kay left their hearts in New York and headed west to San Francisco. But if Shea Stadium proved problematic for Mercer's home run stroke, imagine what awaited him at the infamous Candlestick Park. Candlestick is probably the most difficult ballpark mental-wise to play in. You got the cold, you got the wind. It just was a very difficult place to play. Bobby did hit 34 home runs there in the course of two years. But in 1977, he was off to a new home in Chicago, where once again, wind played a role in his baseball fortunes. You know, I've heard about the Wrigley Field being this huge home run hitter's ballpark that you hit home runs easy there. Well, that's the case when the wind's blowing out. The wind blew from right field to left field about 70% of the time, which was not conducive for a left-handed hitter. Although he never really felt comfortable in San Francisco or Chicago, Bobby still put up respectable numbers in the four and a half years he was away from the Yankees. But no matter where he went, there always seemed to be something following him, a thought that never left his mind. I was still devastated by leaving the Yankees and the pinstripes, and I just didn't feel in my own mind that I belonged to any other place but playing for the Yankees. Coming up next on Yankeeography. The New York Yankees and sports fans everywhere suffered a great loss tonight. One day you're playing baseball, the next day you're at a funeral. Seventy-nine was Mercer's final year at Wrigley Field. He was struggling, the Cubs were treading water, and they offered him the chance to go home. Bob Kennedy was the general manager, and he says to me, the Yankees have some interest in you. How would you feel about that, and what would you do? And I go, well, I think I'd accept that. <laughs> Upon his return to New York, Bobby would eventually reach career milestones of 250 home runs and 1,000 RBIs. Even better, he was reunited with his old friend Thurman Munson. It would, of course, be far too brief. The Yankees were playing the White Sox, three game series of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And so I'd asked Thurman and Lou to come to my house. Thurman and Lou had stayed at our house that weekend. The Sunday afternoon when the last game was over with, we had an off day going back to New York. After the game, we took Thurman to the airport. There was a little small airport near our house out in Chicago. He had flown his plane in there. So he wanted me and my wife to fly with him back to Canton so that we could spend the off day with them. And then he and I would fly back from Canton to play in the series in New York. 
we obviously didn't do that. He gets in there and all by himself and just flies off. And that was the last we saw of him ever. Then to get the call was devastating. The New York Yankees and sports fans everywhere suffered a great loss tonight, that of star catcher Thurman Munson, who was killed this afternoon in an airplane crash. One day you're playing baseball, the next day you're at a funeral. The funeral took place on August 6th, 1979 in Canton. That day, the entire Yankees team flew to Ohio to honor their beloved captain. At the service, emotional eulogies were delivered by Lou Pinella and Mercer. Thurman Munson who wore the pinstripes with number 15. But in living, loving, and legend, history will record my friend the number one. The Yankees said goodbye, then flew home. For that night, they had a game. The atmosphere for this ball game, clouded, obviously. Clouded by the loss of one of the most respected players in the game of baseball, and the captain of the New York Yankees, Thurman Munson. Billy had told me when we got to the ballpark, he said, look, you don't need to be playing tonight. You're exhausted, and you just take the night off. And I said, Billy, I, I can't take the night off. I mean, there's something that I just I feel like I have to play tonight. Going out into left field will be Bobby Mercer, who has to be emotionally drained. He was one of those who delivered a eulogy today. It was a game in tribute to Thurman. This was a special moment because you felt like Thurman was there, too. The Yankees trailed Baltimore four to nothing when Mercer came up with two men on in the seventh. Bobby Mercer had an unbelievable night. He did drive it down the line and it's there. And he was the closest friend I think Thurman had on the team. This is the man who broke down this morning in the middle of his eulogy at Thurman Munson's funeral service. But Bobby had one more swing in him to cap off this emotional night. When the game was on the line, there was a couple of guys on, and I ended up getting the big hit off of Tippy to win the ball game for us. It was a special night, and Sometimes unordinary things happen on special nights. Was that meant to be? Maybe it was. I, I don't know. Munson, his leader, his friend, the man who meant so much to Bobby Mercer in the formulation of his own career. They won this game. Emotion won this game. He was so down over Thurman's passing. And then to have Bobby, one of his closest friends, win the game like that, well, I still get goosebumps. I do know one thing, that after the game, the bat that I used that night, I never did use anymore. In fact, I gave it to Diane, Diane Munson. Bobby Mercer came to my house and brought that bat. He wanted me to have that. This was special for me, special for Thurman, and whatever this bat produced today need to be in the Munson family, so I gave it to her. Welcome back to Yankeeography. In 1980, Mercer finally got his first taste of the postseason. The Yankees won the American League East, but didn't survive the league championship series. Though he was no longer a regular, Bobby could still come through in the clutch. This was never more evident than opening day 1981. Bobby helped the Yankees win the 81 pennant, but his playing time continued to diminish the next two years. So George Steinbrenner offered him a new job in the broadcast booth. He said, well, let me ask you a question. Would you consider retiring? There's a kid by the name of Mattingly down in our minor league system. When I first got called up, Bobby actually, I know they kind of talked him into retirement to give me a spot. I said, well, Mr. Steinbrenner, I said, I'll accept it. I, I will retire. So I retired that day within an hour of a phone call and was in the broadcast booth that night. And I've been there ever since and enjoyed every minute of it. 
It was June 20th, 1983. Bobby was no longer wearing pinstripes, but he was still with the Yankees. And he seemed to fit right in. Hit deep to right field. Holy! Woo! It's out of here! Something about a southern voice seems more baseball. Soriano looking at Turner Wells, and all of a sudden, whoa, he didn't make it, so he turns on the afterburner. And so I think he brings that to it. Hits this one goodbye. Whoa, check that one out, Bernie. He also obviously brings a great knowledge of the game, and he's able to convey that knowledge. He's been there. Because I had no really formal training, obviously, and uh, the one thing that I did know was baseball. See with his swing here on Matsui, very conscious of the fact that he needs to pull the ball. Look how he tries to get on top of it and just chops it. I think Merce blends his country twang and being a Yankee player, and he knows the ins and outs. A lot of these plays like this will loosen that infield up for you, too. It, in the back of their minds, the next time you go up there, they have to play maybe a step closer. One of Bobby's broadcast mentors was Phil Rizzuto, and boy, was that fun. I do miss the days with Phil Rizzuto because Scooter was just a hoot and a half. Now back together for the first. <laughs> What? Oh, we are live. Right? He was a little bit of a straight man when Rizzuto was up there. But I think everybody that announces with Rizzuto ends up being a little bit of a straight man. But Bobby quickly learned that Rizzuto could also be an easy target for some easy going fun. That looks like a horrible red 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 right. Would you eat a pie if you saw that face? <laughs> And fans soon warmed to Mercer's dry sense of humor. Might ask you which stance Vanilla is using now, Bobby. What number stance is uh, this? One? Let me just take one quick look here. That looks like, yep, that's 314. 314. 314. Then in 1986, Bobby became the assistant general manager for the Yankees. But it turned out to be just a short break from the booth. It was an opportunity for me to become the general manager after a year's apprenticeship. It was a tremendous experience for me, knowing uh, behind the scenes what happens. I moved back to the broadcast booth after about a year in the front office. I'm just not a front office guy, you know. <laughs> but it wasn't for naught, as Bobby returned to the microphone with even more insight into the business of the game made me a more rounded uh, broadcaster to see <clears throat> what goes on behind the scenes. Still, Bobby prefers those special Yankees moments that take place on the field. The pine tar game at Yankee Stadium. I mean, that stands out. You are not allowed to have a substance of any kind above the trademark. And I will never forget, when Brett came out of that dugout, I thought I had seen the meanest guy in the world that was just going to destroy everything at Yankee Stadium. Look at this. Brett is out, and uh, David back. David Cohn, perfect game. A perfect Yay! game by David Cohn. There is nobody loved more on this Yankee ball club than David Cohn. How exciting can that be? You want to talk about it forever. I don't know about you, but I'm not really ready to go off the air yet. <laughs> no, <laughs> I can talk I'm about it for a long kind of time. Fun. Bobby's worked with many partners in the broadcast booth, and they all sing his praises. The most pleasurable time was with Bobby Mercer when I had the good fortune of announcing with Bobby. I consider Bobby one of my closest friends. He's a great guy and a great broadcaster and was a hell of a ball player. I think he brings that lineage of Yankee history and he connects people down through the years. He's a guy that played with Mantle. He's that Yankee feeling in the booth and he's a great storyteller. In the booth with Bobby having the Yankee tradition and, and being a Yankee favorite, it's kind of a nice, uh, it's a nice balance. And it's, a, it's always a treat when I get to come to the park and I'm working with Bobby. So looking back, making room for Mattingly wasn't such a bad move after all. I'm so glad I made that decision. And I'm so glad that Mr. Steinbrenner thought of me and called me and asked me and gave me that opportunity. Welcome back to Yankeeography. There was a side to Bobby Mercer that went beyond his life as a ball player and far beyond his work in the broadcast booth. That is the baseball assistance team. 
and it's an assistance program that helps those in need that have uh, been a part of the baseball family. is major leaguers and uh, former major leaguers and their wives and their children. Uh, it's the scouts, uh, it's the front office people, it's the Negro League players. As a member of the board of directors, I have been deeply moved on many occasions by what BAT has done to help so many. BAT raises funds through charity golf tournaments and dinners with the help of former Major League players, many of them legends of the game. Just the dedication of these Hall of Famers that have had great careers and they feel very fortunate to what has happened to them and they want to do something to help somebody else. But it didn't stop there. Mercer got current players to contribute to BAT during his annual spring training visits. And Bobby was the one that said that I'm gonna go around team to team and ask players to donate money. You can imagine that uh, the scout that scouted you back in high school, even in, in Little League, uh, a scout that has uh, not made a whole lot of money in his life, and then all of a sudden the events uh, of his life may turn and turn for the worse. Uh, there is an organization in baseball that can assist him. Well, the players have given back, and they've given a lot back every year. Over the 16 years, we have uh, given out uh, $10.5 million in grants. I've met several of the people who were recipients of uh, monies that it made a tremendous difference. If you sign that today, you will literally be saving somebody's life. Thank you very much. Bobby's efforts to give back Parked back to his roots in Oklahoma. When he came to us, he was interested in the cancer program that we're doing for children and wanted to establish an endowment or a chair in the name of the Mercer family. My oldest brother uh, died of cancer at the age of 47. When he died, uh, I got involved with the American Cancer Society of uh, raising some funds, started a foundation in his name. What the foundation has been able to do is to start an endowment in the state of Oklahoma for pediatric cancer research. Through matching funds, we were able to put into place a million dollar endowed chair. From this memorial foundation that I started, now we're in the area that we've always wanted to be in, which is to find the cure for cancer. And while Mercer's foundation helped in the quest for a cure, it also catered to the needs of current cancer patients. I know in the past we have provided um, vehicle transportation. We bought um, a bus, a small little bus that would take patients to treatment. It's, it's been a variety of things, but mostly help one-on-one -on -one to situations of families that were in need. Bobby epitomized the uh, the feeling of Oklahomans and part of the reason that I came here. The Mercer Family Chair will always be there. When we saw that we could put on events in Oklahoma and we could raise a tremendous amount of money, uh, we were, we just, it was something we wanted to do and, and actually it's so much hard work by so many people and sometimes your name is attached to it and you sort of get all the glory. And that's unfortunate because really there's such a team of people behind you that make it happen. And uh, I, I'm so happy that we got that opportunity to become involved with that. It really means a lot to everybody. The only thing there really is to say is thank you. Coming up next on Yankeeography. Bobby Ray, he's one of my favorite teammates that I played with throughout my career. Let go, Bobby Ray. He was what a true teammate should be. We love Bobby Mercer. We think he's one of the best. <laughs> we now return to Yankeeography. Through his work for charitable causes and as a player, Bobby Mercer always had a knack for rising to the occasion, but in 2006, an unforeseen challenge came his way. I was experiencing these headaches, which we thought were sinus headaches, uh, for several months. And over time, obviously, the, uh, uh, the headaches got a little worse. Uh, I started doing strange things. He would misplace the car keys. He would misplace things. It just, it, it was kind of like he had a little light switch that had been clicked off. MRI revealed a brain tumor. And that was 
That was not the word we wanted to hear. The shock. Yeah. A, a total surprise. That was a total surprise. We, that was nothing I had looked up, I had thought anything about, we hadn't investigated it, and that was the shock. I asked the doctor, I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, it means you got the worst cancer that you can have in the brain. As the bell curve goes, uh, they come up with 14 months to live, is basically what they were saying. But I told him, I said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna be a part of that bell curve. You know? And Bobby was true to his word, refusing to let his condition keep him from the game he loved. Just four months after his diagnosis, there he was in the Bronx. It is opening day at the stadium, and uh, that brings a smile to people's face. But I think everybody is absolutely elated that Bobby Mercer is back in the booth. Bobby, it is so great to see you. How you doing? Well, I'll tell you what, I, you think it's uh, good for everybody else. It's just great for me. People were allowed to uh, show Bobby how much they missed him and how much they loved him and how much they were uh, behind him in his fight. I did a couple of innings there with the guys and uh, it just felt like uh, that's the way it was supposed to be. Who could miss opening day, Yankee Stadium? My goodness gracious. It's a day in our life that we'll, we'll never forget. You can know that uh, I'm uh, anxiously waiting to get back into the Yes booth to uh, do my full schedule this year. He was going to come back to Yankee Stadium a few more times. He was going to get back to the booth a few more times. Hi, everybody. I'm Ken Singleton along with Joe Girardi, and a big welcome back to Bobby Mercer. Obviously, this is a very special day for me, special night, uh, to be back with the Yankees, calling the Yankee games on the Yes Network. And, you know, when he did, uh, it was like there was never anything wrong. Derek Jeter. It's it hard and lines the first pitch into center field to extend his hitting streak to 18 games. It was just an amazing grace that he carried himself with, the way he attacked that disease and never wanted people to feel sorry for him. Well, I'll tell you what, this is a time that A-Rod trusts his hands. It is a blessing to be with the Yankee organization once again and the Yes Network. Uh, I mean, I savor those days and I savor those minutes and those moments and just, you know, being here right now. <laughs> That's who he was. Bobby was a gamer. It was just a real pleasure to be around him. Whether I live to be, uh, you know, 80 or whatever it is, or whether I live to be 62 or, or you know, whatever, uh, you know, I'm satisfied with that. And I just consider every day a blessing. Bobby Merce's courageous fight for life was truly an inspiration. But on July 12th of 2008, he lost the battle and we lost a friend. We ask that you please rise for a moment of silent prayer as we remember former Yankees player and broadcaster Bobby Mercer, who passed away on Saturday at the age of 62. It is sad. It's definitely sad. Um, Bobby was a tremendous uh, person, a tremendous human being, and a great friend. And to lose him like that is, is hard. Everybody in here knows, you know, what kind of person he was and how much he loved, uh, you know, playing for the Yankees and playing in Yankee Stadium. So we, uh, we're going to miss him dearly. I was a kid and I used to watch Bobby Mercer, you know, and he was one of my heroes as a kid. How difficult is this right now, Joe? It's extremely difficult um, because we loved him so much. Less than a month later, hundreds of friends and family, including generations of Yankees, gathered at Bobby's memorial service to say goodbye. If you don't know Bobby Mercer, that's too bad. Those words are so true and to the point, we are all better people and better friends and better human beings because of our friend, Bobby Mercer. As I was sitting there in the memorial and, and several people were talking, I, I thought to myself, you know what? This guy really lived a great life because so many people were touched by him and so many people loved him. We now return to Yankeeography. Seeking a cure for the very disease that took his life had been a cause dear to Bobby Mercer's heart, 
and his devotion to helping those in need through the Duane Mercer Cancer Foundation and the baseball assistance team will always be remembered. Tonight, Tonight we're, we're going, going to be presenting a very special award. It's the inaugural Bobby Mercer Award. He was a great friend, and it was through Bobby's belief that if today's players were presented with the opportunity of a payroll deduction plan for BAT, they would be very supportive. And he was so right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I love seeing him up there. And uh, it is so my honor uh, to have you remember him with this award. The inaugural Bobby Mercer Award was given to both the 2009 Houston Astros and New York Yankees as the teams that donated the most to bat. I was extremely proud of our club for them giving back to the community of baseball. When I think of Bobby Mercer, I think of a man who always made your day better. He's a man that had a vision and his vision goes on, and I thank you, Bobby. Bobby Mercer was a great person, uh, cared for people. <laughs> he appreciated life, he appreciated friends, he appreciated being a Yankee. Here's the ever popular Bobby Mercer. It was in 1965 when Bobby Mercer first wore the uniform of the team he so dearly loved. His pride in the pinstripes was boundless, and he'll forever be remembered as both a great Yankee and a wonderful man. It's good to remember how important Bobby Mercer was to the franchise while he played, and uh, his presence in the booth underscores that this was the man for a long time. That guy just adored the Yankee franchise. It meant so much to him. The pinstripes to him were everything. Hey, New York Police Department, my got a guy. Being able to really live out your dream and for such a long tenure and have such a relationship with the pinstripes, I mean, you cannot get any better. It's all about Yankee history. It's all about the pinstripes and the guys that played here. Bobby is a cherished member of the Yankees family and no one appreciates his place in Yankees history more than his former teammates. Bobby was a great friend to everyone. He was, he was what a, a, a true teammate should be. Bobby is kind of that link with, with Mantle. I remember that more than anything, kind of that presence you need in the clubhouse. When he said that, everybody went, Bobby Mercer, man. Get me, Bobby Mercer. Bobby and I were real good friends. Mercer's a hard worker. <laughs> Watch what you say. <laughs> yeah, he's a hard worker. Uh, we like talking baseball. Uh, Bobby enjoyed talking baseball. He'd sit in that rocking chair in, in New York, and I can still envision him sitting back there and rocking. Bobby Ray, he's one of my favorite teammates that I played with throughout my career. That goes. Bobby Ray. Oh, what a great guy, what a great teammate. We love Bobby Mercer. We <laughs> think he's one of the best all time. Yeah, see, I just want to be like, look at the pipe. You're going to get a knock. You're going to get a knock today. I want to get a knock, all right, probably from my wife. Oh, he's a great guy. Bobby was great. When we start talking about Ron Guidry and we start talking about Reggie Jackson and, the, and these kind of people, I think the average Yankee fan put him in that category. I think Yankee fans put him in that same pantheon as the great Yankees. I'm one of the lucky people, the very few lucky people, that has had that opportunity of uh, being a player and putting on the pinstripes. And it just means everything that's good in life as far as baseball is concerned. There's something you should know about what made Bobby Mercer such a special and beloved person. He always had time for others, whether offering a friendly hello to each person he passed during his day, or by taking the time to listen to those in need and lend a hand any way he could. Bobby Mercer may not have been the greatest player ever to wear the pinstripes, but he was certainly one of the most caring and best loved. For the Yes Network, I'm John Sterling. And thanks for watching Yankeeography.
The proceeding has been an exclusive presentation of the Yes Network.